This is day three of the June 90 seven day retreat at Springwater. There are three questions that would be good to get to if we have the time today. And then yet another thing about something I said two days ago, which has come up in several meetings. The three questions are, how does one look? Where does inquiry come from? And what is spirit, a spiritual life? And the thing I want to talk about first, because at least three or four people brought it up in meetings after having said in one of the talks, using the example of watching a Krishnamurti tape, that we so quickly get engaged in the personality of the speaker, whether he's arrogant or prejudiced, or impolite or impatient, or loving and selfless, and over this engagement in his personality, or what appears to be his personality, what may get lost is to look at what he's saying. And what people have mentioned is, Don't we need to also look at the personality of a speaker? Because he or she may say all manner of beautiful things, and yet the way he or she lives is totally in contradiction, or at least at times in total contradiction to what is said. One hears so much about what goes on with spiritual leaders, their private lives. And yet, as another person said, can one also put that aside as one listens, if one does listen to a person? And then how does one listen? And where does the speaker come from? And can one tell where he or she comes from? Does he or she precisely come from this, involved, from an involvement with personality cult, wanting something, power, for instance, acknowledgement or tremendous admiration, or does he or she come out of emptiness? The emptiness of no one wanting something for oneself. And can, as a listener, can one tell? Can one tell when oneself is involved in wanting something? Being involved in one's investments in oneself and what one is attached to? Or is it indeed possible that both 
the one who talks and the one who listens, both come out of this state of emptiness, of listening freshly this moment, with no investment, no wanting, and just listening or speaking. This is a question that each one of us can ask if we care to. We, we did a lot of it on the first day, and I don't want, to, don't want to go over it all again, about the listening. What may be blocking the listening? One may find there's, there's no such thing as a state of emptiness. And then, does despair set in, or discouragement or comparison or can one just in all simplicity question the obstacles what is in the way what do I want right now what am I afraid of does something intimidate me or is scary about what a person says. We can look at everything and anything if we're so inclined. Nothing is taboo to look at, to question alone and together. One person in connection also with this remark that I made. Mentioned that all the personality problems and the suffering coming from them was very essential in his life to come to this work, to come to questioning. Without all of this striving and evil, ego, uh, comp compulsion of his life and the suffering coming from it would have never stopped and wondered if there is a different way. We weren't putting down personality. That's, that's not what I was doing. Just wondering whether in the process of making something out of a person who talks or possibly projecting onto the person. There is a hindrance in listening to what is being said and looking for oneself, whether what is said is so or not. The, the energy not diverted into projecting onto the person or making something out of him or her that becomes the important thing rather than what is being said. That was really the gist of what I was saying. And yet clearly, in speaking, pointing things out, Does one also live that way? At least part of the time. Or is speaking one thing and the way one lives a totally different department, or compartment? We're leaving aside right now the whole question of whether what one perceives in a speaker is actually so or can be project a product of projection. It would be interesting to look at sometime. What is projection and can, 
can one find out by inquiry, by looking carefully, inwardly, whether indeed projection is taking place or not. Projection meaning it's not what the person is like, but one sees him or her that way. But we'll leave that for another time. Maybe it'll come up in a different connection. The first question was, how does one look? person mentioned in, in the midst of this barrage of thoughts going through the mind. Thoughts, emotions, feelings, more thoughts, remembrances, associations, dreams, fantasies, the, this whole ongoing, seem, seemingly interminable stream of consciousness. How is one to look at that? Not long ago, on a Sunday afternoon, we had the visit of a mother with a little baby little seven-month-old baby. And people sort of naturally seem to gather around this baby to watch the baby. Because the baby was watching everything. It was not at that state of self-consciousness, look at me, watch me, that that wasn't there. After being fed, the mother put him down and with his five little bent fingers, he started to scratch the rug back and forth. And because he was fed now and that was playtime, the mother rolled a big colored ball toward him. Of course, I paid attention to the ball and pushed it back, but the the scratching was interrupted by an adult feeling having to do something for this baby. But regardless of the rug and ball, there were lots of things going on. A person entering through the door and one could see in the whole movement of the baby's body, the head, that he was aware somebody was entering the room. It seemed that everything was right there with him without any effort at being attentive which is of course ridiculous the baby doesn't make an effort to be attentive it's just happening Years later, we ask, how are we to look? For almost all of us, unless very traumatic experience happened very early in our life, there was such a time when feeling, touching, listening, hearing, seeing was all one movement in harmony with the environment, not separate from it. The moving of a, a tree in the wind was the moving of the head and the eyes looking and the ears listening. Someone, while, while the baby was playing with a colored ball, was putting a, a football near him. And of course, this is what he wanted to touch. But the mother was concerned, football may have been dirty. So she moved the football 
out of his way. And he started laboring to get there. That's interesting. Did he want that football because it was taken away already? Who knows? It wasn't as colorful as that colored ball. But he'd already seen that, and this was something new. He couldn't have it for a while, and didn't cry. Later on, the football was close again, the mother wasn't looking, and he was licking, <laughs> licking it. <laughs> Not just rolling it, touching it, scratching it, but also licking it. All, all the senses there as one exploring, finding out. Not because he had a practice. <laughs> we have one. Many of us have one or had one. And is that conditioning to practice in a certain way a hindrance to attending openly, freely to what is going on around us as well as this barrage, this stream, this Niagara of consciousness, of thoughts and feelings, emotions, remembrance as we, we listed it all. How is one to look? I don't know if there is a how, or whether there is just looking maybe just a moment at a time, waking up from thought and fantasy, and the realization that this is what has been going on. And at that moment of waking up from thought and fantasy, maybe not the instant condemnation of that fact, but the listening to the wind, the breath, the feeling of the warmth of the air or the coolness of the breeze. A moment of that, without the intention to look or listen, they're just being that openness for a moment, not beset by the thought, I must pay attention, I must keep this going. These thoughts do come up. And then what happens? As one put, person put it 20 minutes later, I realize what happened. Not at the moment when thought, fantasy, judgment takes over. There is no awareness, maybe just a little partial attention, but mostly it's totally being totally involved in it. So that's our first question. At, at a moment of coming to, of waking up from dream and fantasy, from this stream of ongoing consciousness, at the moment of coming to, what is there? Not what should I do, how should I proceed, but what is there? It doesn't even have to be verbalized. There is something there, isn't there? There's a body breathing, there's a wind, a wind stirring, heart beating. 
knee or back or shoulder, neck aching. That's all there at this moment of coming to. It's not how should I look, but what happens when I look, when there is looking. Does the brain immediately bring up commands, instructions on how to proceed? Then the, the openness of seeing, hearing, touching, listening, feeling is gone. It's the narrowness of following instruction. And can that be seen as it happens or after it happens, 20 minutes later? Amazing thing is that in, in waking up, whether it's from a daydream or a night dream, the mind has that capacity to see at a glance that a dream has been taking place. Sometimes in great detail, all the intricacies of the dream, upon waking up, they're there. And the dream, daydream or night dream, has evoked all kinds of pleasant or unpleasant feelings throughout the body. They're there. When they're pleasant, they don't provide a pro pro pose a problem. One wants to continue with them, which is a problem too. But one doesn't feel in conflict with pleasant feelings. When the feelings are anxiety or fear or pain, then to, to just be with that. The words are dualistic. The, the state need not be. To just be with that is something one may dread to do, one has never done. It's, it's something that seems dangerous or will bring about more pain, all kinds of assumptions in the mind about directly facing the pain, the anxiety, the panic, that remembrance, dream, has brought about. It's, it's in the doing, in, in not escaping, in, in really feeling it, that one may realize it's not at all dangerous to be with something that's there, to feel it all the way. And with that, to invalidate the assumption that one must not touch something that feels painful or discomforting, unsettling. It can be felt, it can be survived. Not only survived, but in the no separation of this just being there as it is, there may be a new energy manifesting. The energy that's there when there is no division, no escape, all this uh, barrage of prejudices against something, wanting to get rid of it or overcome it, because it's bad. How does one look at a flower along the mode path or in these beautiful beds we have around the house? How does one look at one flower, one has to look to find out, doesn't one? what happens in looking at just one flower. It's the brain scan to find a name or it can produce it instantly, it is a such and such, or what is it, what is the name of it. And then comments about it 
like or dislike, one may wonder whether it's fragrant. Talked about it recently in a retreat that some of us were discussing whether a flower was fragrant or not. And it took a while before someone stooped down to smell it. If that word flower can be put aside, because having the word flower in the mind already does something. One has seen flowers, one has maybe painted flowers or made poems about flowers, and all of that may enter into the perception or veil the directness of perception. So if one wonders, what is this thing? Like a little baby not knowing it's a flower, but seeing something strikingly yellow and red, and going to it, touching it, scratching it, pulling at it, not advising that we pull a flower. Well, our, our son used to do that. <clears throat> he ate flowers, <laughs> particularly begonias little fibrous begonias. He could pick one after another and eat it. What is it? What is it? It's, it's something to look at and to see. Not just, I must see that clearly. Can one hear that if that command is put out by the computer, the brain? You've got to see it clearly. She, she talks about that. Or I can't see it clearly. Somebody else may, I will never, or maybe in 10 years I will. Then listen to that, so that the whole thing is there, quite obvious and revealed in an attention that is not selective, that is not compelled to do something, to perform something or attain something. It's just there with a flower. It's not a separation between attention and flower. How does one look? Can there be a looking without the one, me? Just looking. Not forever or for a long time or longer than last time, but looking. not even knowing what it is or what it will bring. Not knowing what looking is or what the flower is and therefore just, just this. The birds are included. It's not a separate thing to listen to the birds or look at a flower. How does one listen? It's the same question. <coughs> to be aware of all that happens when this question is put. How does one listen? How do I listen to the bird? word, bird, some common reaction. It's nice, it's nicer than the bulldozers last night. <clears throat> then there's already another thing going on in the mind. But we're not saying it's bad or wrong. Can one see it? It's going on. It's a fact. 
and then wondering again about what is going on in listening to a bird or the wind, the voice. And not starting in with ideas and knowledge, but starting with not knowing. That little baby didn't know yet. That's why there was this incredible openness and responsiveness to everything happening. But we have built up tremendous storages of knowledge and reactions and experiences. And it seems almost impossible for that to cease in a moment of listening and looking. Or to not interfere. But one must have no assumptions about it, no conclusion. Just wondering what is happening in looking and listening, and therefore looking and listening. And with that, we come to the next question. <clears throat> Where does inquiry come from? What makes us inquire? Is one looking or waiting for me to, to answer? For several people who asked that question, it came up in connection with our talking at great length about wanting. Our constant state of wanting, desiring. And then the question, well, where, where does inquiring come from? From is that just another wanting, another desire? One can look. One can't ask, answer any question of this kind without looking. Looking freshly, because what we understood yesterday may not hold for today, or it may just be a dead memory and not an alive looking and questioning now. So, does questioning come out of desire? Desiring to, to do the right thing? Because in this place, that seems to be the system that's going on, inquiring, questioning. So, being here, I should do the right thing. Be part of the system. Some people have mentioned that to me. Not quite in this form. So then there would be a desire to conform to what is perceived as the thing to be done. And a desire not only to conform, but by conforming to attain something. A state of pure listening, maybe. Or a state of pure inquiring or meditative inquiry. Is that where our questions come from? Maybe there's some of this mixed in. Maybe it's not the whole thing. For a lot of us, inquiring and questioning came out of tremendous suffering, pain, disturbance, anxiety. A despair at a world that seemed in such tremendous confusion, full of hatred, violence, 
absence of love and understanding. And out of that, the question, what is the sense of it all? Why does it go on? Does it have to go on? Does one have to participate in it? So, very often inquiry comes out of despair at the confusion, at the senselessness of one's life and the life one witnesses and sees around one, one beginning to wonder about it. Maybe partly the desire to be rid of the suffering that's mixed in there. But even apart from that desire to be rid of the suffering, wondering about it, In one of the meetings where we were discussing this, I mentioned that passion is different from desire. Having a passion to find out something. The person said, you know, passion, that word comes from suffering. Or has, had, has that root of suffering in it. Or she mentioned, maybe just cur- having curiosity. Like we started out, the curiosity of a child that needs to find out what everything around it is, including his toes, chewing on those. Of course, one can't carry the analogy with a child too far. And we are no longer children. We cannot possibly become children again. It's impossible. We're all conditioned and programmed now. And that little baby, alas, will also be. As the formal instructions move in on him, this overall open curiosity will begin to become channeled and rewarded and and punished and praised And being liked and getting attention for good grades will become much more important than scratching the rug to find out. So is there, one could argue this, is there innate within the human being an an urge to find out, to to be clear, to, for things to make sense, to have meaning, to have order in the midst of chaos. I don't know whether we have to pause it, whether there is something within us, congenitally born with us and part of the human heritage. It doesn't matter, but one can observe it now, whether it's there some interest in why we live the way we live, why we react the way we react, why we dream and fantasize, why we can't see each other clearly, project images upon each other. One has to already see that to to question why we do it. Why we suffer. Maybe that's the first thing, why we are in pain, in fear of each other, in rivalry and competition with each other. Why? And the the amazing thing is, once a question takes root, 
I don't mean that it is being practiced and repeated mechanically as a practice, but the question grips one. One is aflame with it, afire with it. Then something happens. Things do reveal themselves, or books, people, all kinds of things happen to come in one's way. One meets up with it. And then does the inquiry die because one feels one has the answers? Or will one question the answers? Or will one remain with the relief of some peace inside, maybe momentarily? Or does questioning return? <coughs> one has to find out, one has to see and watch. In discussing it this morning in the meeting, when, when the person asked, where does inquiry come from? And pausing to look, it seemed that there are two inquiries. One is how it all started. When one started to question, What is, what is the sense of this life, the meaning of it? Why are we born? Why do we have to die? Questions like that. And the other was at that moment of sitting. A beautiful morning. No cloud in the sky, and the sun coming up. Gilding just the tops of the grasses and trees. Where does inquiry come from? Is there inquiry when the mind is open, in tune, in touch? Without wanting, without fearing? There isn't inquiry, but there is not knowing. And this not knowing is the openness of being in touch, of listening and feeling, seeing. Not knowing. And where does that come from? I don't know. Can thought be quiet for a moment? It always wants to know where, where does this come from? And it's, it's function to ask those questions. And set the mind going f from accepting and mechanically repeating or to, to, to wondering and with that wondering, interrupting habits that have been taken granted for decades. It's a function of thought to question. But some things thought can never get at. No matter how much it asks, where does something come from? Well, it comes from, from memory. It comes from past experiences, but we're where do past experiences and memory come from? Where does one come from? Well, one comes from one's father and mother. And where did they come from? And where did animals come from in life? Where did that come from? And this earth, where did it come from? We still have theories about it. Where did the Big Bang come from? What was there before it? Where did God come from?
Where did everything come from? I don't know where it came from, but it's here. The last question was, what is a spiritual life? That question took me by surprise because I don't usually talk about, I don't use those terms. But then quickly remembered that in this new edition of the work of this moment, the publisher, on the left-hand page, where it's said where a book can be found in the library, does mention twice spiritual life. <laughs> I didn't ask the person whether this is why she asked. I don't use it because it's been used so much to point to something that's sort of elevated or lofty. In some way elitist. Opposed to another kind of life. And yet, in looking, during the meeting, looking what is spiritual life, what came up was a gathering of energy to look into this moment, the truth of this moment. The looking, the truthful looking, not hemmed in by wanting or fearing. And can one live out of that looking and inquiring? So it does not become another department in one's life which one occasionally enters and then leaves again. But that the looking and listening and inquiring into what is the truth of this moment, into whether looking and listening can be truthful, open, unlimited, not hemmed in, by personality and background and prejudices and so forth, whether that can be a way of living. Not perfectly all the time, not a perfect way of living, but wondering, putting the question, is that what spiritual life would be? looking, listening, inquiring, alone and together with, with other people who are also interested, not going out to convert, to persuade, with all the violence that goes with it, gross and subtle, but a, a coming together which, which happens on its own. It happens. It doesn't have to be produced or sought after or gone out to drum up. And 
very relevant what we talked about yesterday. I think it was our first question somebody brought up. What's the difference between two people coming together and looking at the same thing together? regardless of their backgrounds or personalities, in friendship, and at another time, two people being at each other's throat. I wouldn't say being at each other's throat is living a spiritual life. And yet to inquire into it, what's, what's going on? What's the truth of it? Why do we do it? And then to watch as we go to get each other or win over each other or fight each other, compete with each other. To, to inquire into it broadly, openly, deeply, alone or together. find out the truth of, of living, of being. Is, is, that spirit, is that the spiritual life? The word spirit, if one doesn't take it the way I mentioned before, spirit implies something open, not massive. Almost insubstantial, not material. Freely moving and not to be grasped or held on to. That's what this word implies in a way. But one has to be careful not to make an entity out of it, which is a product of the imagination. An, an open, free, flexible looking is not an entity. It's, I don't know what it is. It's not a me doing it. It's not a me possessing it. It's just something that happens. That is there for human beings. If we're not all caught up in wanting and fearing, and therefore creating image upon image, and then taking the image for the spirit. Spirit meaning nothing. Not nothing of a vacuum, but nothing of nothing to be grasped. Held on to. No thing, just everything.
We will end here for today.